It's the holidays in Houston, Texas. Festive lights illuminate the city while others flash ominously on a 911 switchboard. He, he told you he put the body in a trash can and dumped it in Spring Creek? Yes. Two days before this shocking 911 call, it's Christmas morning for 26-year-olds Jason Sanford and Melissa Soders. You know, we were happy. Everything was going right. The Texas sweethearts are spending their first holiday together as a couple. She told me that she didn't usually get to spend Christmas or anything with her parents. So that was one thing she wanted to do. And so we went and we saw her parents for Christmas. Jason and Melissa met in grade school and only recently reconnected. It was like nothing else mattered. It was like it was just her and I. Except it wasn't. Melissa is in the middle of a messy divorce with her soon-to-be ex-husband, 28-year-old Matthew Soders, and they have four young daughters together, ranging from 18 months to eight years old. Matthew and Melissa married at a young age. They were basically teenagers. They grew up together. Over a nine-year period, um, they were together. As seen during happier times in this cell phone video. All right, now we're watching Melissa crack open her crab. Say hi to the camera, honey but as most people do, they drift apart as they get older. Heartbroken, Matthew files for divorce. Melissa, the manager of a fast food restaurant, grants him full custody of their children while she gets her finances in order. She didn't have a job where she could support her four daughters, so she left him with Matt knowing that his parents would help him until she got more stable on her feet with Jason. Matthew's father, David Soders, is a well-respected journalist. He works as a copy editor at the area's largest newspaper, the Houston Chronicle. Matthew came from a good family in that he was adopted by a very good family. Along with his twin sister from an orphanage in Nicaragua. And while Melissa knows her kids are in good hands with Matthew's parents, she misses them desperately. She's never spent a Christmas without her babies, and she wanted to see them. So the day after Christmas, she does just that. The plan is to meet her estranged husband and her youngest daughter at a local fast food restaurant. We spoke on the phone until he showed up. And as soon as she sh he showed up, she told me and she hung up. Jason is expecting a phone call from Melissa following her family visit. I've been trying to call her, text her. He waits all day to hear from her. And no response. It's now after 7 p.m. and nearly eight hours since he's last talked to Melissa. Jason heads to the Harris County Sheriff's Office and files a missing persons report. It was very overwhelming, everything that was going through my head. Melissa's family is notified that she is missing. Her aunt Belinda, traveling back to Nevada from Texas, touches down just in time to catch the frantic phone call. I just got home from Christmas and, um, my older sister told me that she was missing. I'm like, what are you talking about? We just seen her. What do you mean she's missing? It doesn't take long for the media to get wind of the story, and the missing Houston woman becomes headline news. It got a lot of attention because it's Christmas time. A mother of four is missing. But for one journalist, the story is painfully personal. Remember, Matthew's father works for the Houston Chronicle, placing him smack dab in the middle of the news coverage of his own daughter-in-law's disappearance. As tragic as it can get. Then a huge break in the case. It's less than 24 hours from the time Melissa is reported missing, the Harris County Sheriff's Department receives a bizarre 911 call. Harris County 911, you need police, fire, ambulance. Police. It's a woman on the line requesting to remain anonymous, claiming to be Matthew Soder's neighbor. But in the apartments next door to me. The caller tells dispatch she made an unexpected visit to Matthew's apartment, and when she looked inside... I saw someone's feet on the ground. So you went to the apartment and saw someone's feet? Mm-hmm. Okay. All right, I'll get a deputy out to you, okay? All right. In a matter of minutes, a deputy arrives on scene and questions the caller in person. The investigator records the conversation. Well, I went to the door and started knocking, and, you know, he was there with his daughter. It's like, you know, why is she crying? He's like, oh, no, she's just upset. And the door was open, and all I saw were two feet. Yeah. 
and they wasn't moving. Yeah. And there was human feet. Mm-hmm. I can tell they were female. And the neighbor thought and said, whose feet are those behind the couch? And he said, none of your business, and slammed the door in the face. Fearing someone's life could be in danger, deputies raced to Matthew's apartment. They have no idea what they're about to walk into. The deputies show up. Matthew is already gone at this point. And when cops barge through the apartment door, there's no body or evidence of a crime. We didn't have anything linking Matthew. Still trying to piece together the caller's disturbing eyewitness account, detectives call Matthew down to the station for questioning. God, please be okay. Anxious detectives start questioning Matthew immediately. Anything crazy happened inside the apartment? No. Then Matthew offers up details cops never saw coming. But I did ask her, does Jason know that we're still intimate with each other? No, I haven't told him that. Why are you going to make love to me and then go home with him? That's right. Matthew claims he and his ex are in the middle of a love triangle, and Melissa is the sexual aggressor. We sit on the couch watching a movie of The Walking Dead, and then she kind of inch over close. I'm like, please don't kiss me. She's like, I can't help it. Then detectives ask Matthew how the visit ended. She turns around, looks at me, and goes, I'm a horrible mother. No, you're not. Matt, I'm a horrible wife. I don't understand how you love me so much. I've hurt you so bad. Matthew tells cops their conversation lasted 30 minutes, and then Melissa left. And when she left the apartment over on Paramana, he said she just left on foot. Yes. Just took off walk. Any idea where she was going to? No, I was like, we can take you back to McDonald's. She goes, leave me alone. That's when detectives holding their cards close to their vest reveal the ace up their sleeve. They ask Matthew about the alleged visit from his neighbor. Did she come by the apartment? No. Sure, she didn't come to the apartment, knock on the door, come by the apartment? No, she not at all. Any reason why she'd say that she saw you and Melissa at the apartment? No, she wasn't there at the apartment. Detectives ask Matthew if he will take a polygraph test. I'll be clear soon enough. We don't need the poly to do anything. Matthew is defiant. He denies any involvement in his estranged wife's disappearance. Is there anything else you can tell us right now that would help us find Melissa? Look into that guy, Jason. It's been a full day since anyone has seen or heard from the 26-year-old Texas mother of four, Melissa Soders. Then, breaking news, a surveillance video surfaces. It came out over the TV news. Her and Jason were on camera. The video is from Christmas Day at a local business run by Jason Sanford's godparents. As seen here, Melissa and Jason enter the business. There's plenty of smiles and even gifts exchanged, but in less than 24 hours from the time this video is recorded... There was no sign of her. No phone call, no nothing. Then deputies get a tip. A white 1995 Honda Accord matching the description of Melissa's car is spotted in the parking lot of a truck stop off Interstate 45. They found her car. It's located roughly eight miles from Matthew's apartment, the last known place she visited before vanishing. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's going on inside? Well, I told my family Matthew has something to do with it. She told me as soon as I wasn't, I was here when that happened. And the first thing out of her mouth was, Matthew had something to do with this. Yeah. Now I'm scared. The car was a recent purchase by Melissa and her boyfriend, Jason Sanford, a man cops know very little about. But that's about to change when cops pull his police records. Jason's rap sheet reveals a violent past that's not so in the past. Just three months before his girlfriend went missing, the 26-year-old was arrested and charged with assault. Now, cops wonder if Melissa's estranged husband was right when he told them... Jason's a bad guy. Jason might have done this. Jason's the one you need to be looking at. So they do, and ask Jason to come down to the sheriff's office. The conversation is recorded, and detectives discover more than an assault record. There's a marriage license, too. You're still currently married, is that correct? Yes. But Jason claims he is going through a divorce. And what about that recent assault charge? It was my best friend for 14 years. 
found out that was, you know, he was sleeping with my wife and I got mad and, and we got into a little tussle on the street. So far, Jason seems to have an explanation for everything. Then the million dollar question. Let me just go ahead and get this out of the way. I'll go ahead and ask you right now. Did you have anything to do with Melissa's disappearance? Not at all. Not did at you all. do anything to harm Melissa? Never. Never. That was my angel. I yeah. loved her. I would give everything okay. for her. And one final question. Would he take a polygraph test? You have any problem doing that? Not at all. Not at all. Anything you need. What was your impression of Jason after interviewing him? Did you think he had something to do with Melissa's disappearance? Initially, we weren't really sure. But this case has more twists and turns than a Texas two-step. When Melissa's best friend speaks with the detectives, she paints a frightening picture of Melissa and Matthew's marriage, a relationship she says is filled with obsession. She would like basically almost call me in tears, like saying, he won't leave me alone. He wants me back constantly. Terror. Did she ever say anything to you about you know, being scared about something happening? Was she afraid yeah. of? She was afraid to go over there. And then something nightmares are made of. She told me one time that he tried kidnapping her from work one night. At this point, despite all the information coming in, detectives can't be sure who is responsible for Melissa's disappearance. We had two main suspects that we were looking at almost immediately. Both Jason and Matthew. Correct. Mm -hmm. As detectives try to figure out who is telling the truth, another 911 call lights up the switchboard at the Harris County Dispatch. Harris County 911, do you need police fire ambulance? Um, I need to kick somebody in. You want to turn somebody in? <laughs> Where is Houston mother of four, Melissa Soders? Detectives narrow their suspects down to two, Melissa's estranged husband, Matthew Soders, and her current boyfriend, Jason Sanford. But that's about to change. Harris County 911, do you need police fire ambulance? Um, I need to kick somebody in. This 911 caller is scared and wants to remain anonymous. I don't want my name to come out. But she has no problem blurting out one name, Matthew. What is Matthew's last name? Do you know? Soders. I know him. He was a really good friend of mine. Friend, it's way more than that. The woman on the other end of the line claims to be Matthew Soder's lover. She tells dispatch that after Melissa went missing, Matthew stopped by her place. And he come over last night, soaked him wet from head to toe. Truck was all muddy. And then she drops this. He said he blacked out and snapped and choked her to death in Hunter Body in Spring Creek. In a trash can. He told you he put the body in a trash can and dumped it in Spring Creek? Yes. Police contact Texas EquiSearch, a volunteer search and recovery team with access to boats, divers, and sonar equipment. We got a lot of challenges out there with all that debris that's in the water. Then investigators ask Matthew's girlfriend if she'd be willing to wear a wire and get him to confess once again. She agrees and sets up a meeting with her lover three days later. A digital voice recorder given to her by detectives records their conversation. Got a good case, told him all that what happened. Matthew goes on to tell her he's confident he'll get away with murdering Melissa since cops haven't found a body. Because right now they haven't found it. I don't think they're going to find it. Matthew's lover pushes him to turn himself in. <laughs> then the woman makes an appeal for human decency. I just think there was a proper burial. Tip it in. Send it on the The cops are listening to every sordid detail. He really didn't believe that there's any way that we could figure this out or there was any way that we could pin this on him. Then there's another big break in the case. Detectives receive information about an area of the creek where Matthew could have dumped Melissa's body. It's a familiar space. He goes fishing there. That's his favorite spot. I just had the gut feeling. Searchers focused their sonar detectors in that area of the creek. There was something very interesting I was looking for, and I really studied it hard last night. New Year's Eve and New Year's Day come and go. 
It's now January 2nd and day seven in the search for Melissa Soders. We believe that Matthew is the one that's killed Melissa, but we haven't found her body yet. Then just downstream, search team spots something below the water. We ended up finding Melissa's body in a creek and Melissa had been weighted down and was, you know, pretty deep in the water. And how do they know it's Melissa? The coroner's office will make the official identification, but there's one thing the cops zero in on. It's a tattoo near her hip bone. Four letters, one word, Matt. It wasn't until they, they called me asking me for information about identifying marks on her body, tattoos, stuff like that, that it hit me. Oh my God, she, she is dead. Melissa's family is devastated. They tore my heart out. I just couldn't imagine. It was a shock. It was a shock. The coroner officially identifies the body as Melissa Soders, but due to the cold wintertime water and the body being submerged for seven days. Unfortunately, the medical examiner's office could not tell us an exact cause of death, but they ended up ruling the case what they call homicidal violence. In other words, you know, someone did something to her, they just can't say exactly what. Still cops are ready to get their man. As soon as we found Melissa's body, we were able to get the warrant for Matthew's arrest. So. We knew that Matthew had an idea that this was coming. Undercover special ops teams are watching the house, ready to strike if Matthew tries to make a break for it. Then there's movement. And we saw Matthew attempting to leave the house with his dad. Matthew is arrested and charged with his wife's murder. Obviously, you're in custody, you're under arrest. You know, you've been charged with murder. You know, we now have Melissa's body. Thank you. Melissa's been found. Unlike their last interview, Matthew doesn't want to talk to anyone except his lawyer. <laughs> News cameras are there as Matthew Soders appears in court. Matthew Soders, you're here on a charge of capital murder, and I'm led to believe that it involves the murder of two people, including a, a uh, unborn child. That's right, Matthew's estranged wife was two months pregnant at the time of her murder. According to some of Melissa's friends, she had pictures on her phone of the positive pregnancy test. The baby wasn't Matthew's. Jason was the father of her baby. Sadly, a baby he will never meet. I mean, it was, it was heartbreaking. I didn't want to believe it. We think that maybe Matthew uh, saw some of the stuff on her phone related to the pregnancy. Maybe that's what caused him uh, to snap. After gathering all the evidence, prosecutors believe Matthew knew his wife was pregnant when he killed her, but they aren't sure they can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They are forced to vacate the capital murder charge. We ended up pleading him to the crime of murder, where we don't have to prove that she knew she was pregnant, but just that he wanted to kill her. Facing a mountain of incriminating evidence, Matthew pleads guilty to murder. His father and copy editor at the Houston Chronicle releases a statement to his own newspaper. He says, quote, I'm proud of him for taking responsibility and sparing everybody a trial. And no trial means we will never hear Matthew's side of the story. So we reached out to him. Since Matthew Soders was put behind bars, he hasn't talked to anyone. However, today he was scheduled for an exclusive Crime Watch Daily interview with me from behind bars. However, when we arrived, he wouldn't even come out of his cell. But whatever Matthew's story, it doesn't change the fact Melissa is gone. Why leave the kids without a mother and a father? He was adopted himself. He was at an orphanage when his parents adopted him and his twin sister. He would know what it's like, you know, to not have parents. Melissa's children remain with Matthew's parents while their father serves out a 60-year sentence with the possibility of parole after 30 years. But Melissa's family claims they got a worse sentence, life without Melissa. What would you say to Melissa? I miss you and I love you. I wish you were here.
and I will never forget her. <laughs>